a topic that came up as a result of talking to you. Um, because I was hearing things about, for example, people being able to stop smoking once they started taking protandum. I started searching the literature, and it turned out there's a real story there. And dots were connected. It's an idea at this point. It hasn't been validated. You've given me a lot of anecdotal feedback, and I'm more convinced than ever that this will pan out. But let me tell you how it works. Can Protandum help in the management of addictive behavior? What this story is about is how some chemical substances, some molecules, have learned how to take control of that remarkable system to create their own sense of longing that needs to be satisfied, and paradoxically, to satisfy it acutely. Cocaine, which I hope affects nobody in here, and nicotine, which probably has affected some of you in here. So we've learned how these things work in the brain, and what they have in common. The mechanism by which cocaine causes addiction is not fundamentally different from the mechanism that nicotine causes addiction, perhaps to things like food addiction. And if you think about it, they're really not that different. The longing sensation you have for food is a, a survival value to get hungry and eat, keep your energy levels up. Now, let me show you how this is now understood to work. This is a brain, and you see right there in the middle, there's a, a red region labeled N accumbens, nucleus accumbens, designated by scientists who study these things as the pleasure center of the brain. It controls things like hunger, things like desire, and satiation from, from those feelings. There's a specific part of the brain where this uh, is handled. Brain cells communicate with one another by releasing chemicals so that one neuron can release these chemicals when it's at the region of, its, of that cell that's very close to the next neuron. Neurons are like short segments of wire, if you will. So you need to get a signal from one conductor to the next. And this is called firing of nerve cells, firing of neurons. And it's chemically induced, so one cell releases a neurotransmitter. That signal is picked up. It's like a speaker and a microphone, picked up by the next cell, which can send that signal down its length. One of those neurotransmitters that's very important in the brain, there are a lot of them, serotonin, dopamine, you may have heard about. Uh, one of them is glutamate. In this particular region of the brain that I'm talking about, the nucleus accumbens, that feeling of satisfaction is due to maintaining a basal level of glutamate. The brain is putting it to a particular use. It's been found just recently that cocaine blunts the activity of this region of the brain to release glutamate by downregulating a gene that enables glutamate to get into the cell. Here's a cell, and the yellow protein you see on the membrane of that cell labeled XCT. It works exactly like a revolving door on an office building. It lets cysteine, one molecule, that's an amino acid, into the cell, but it only lets it in if there's a glutamate inside coming out the revolving door at the same time. This one will let cysteine in only if glutamate comes out. Now, the cysteine is very important, and I had questions this morning about Glutathione. Glutathione is an important antioxidant. It's one of the, the antioxidants dramatically affected by protandum because among the 500 genes protandum regulates are the ones seen here in blue, glutathione synthase, that enables a cell to make its own glutathione. So if that enzyme goes up and more cysteine comes into the cell, you can make more glutathione. That cell is protected from oxidative stress. What we're looking here uh, looking at here is the reverse part of that revolving door. Every time a cysteine comes in, which enables the cell to make glutathione, a good thing, this brain cell pumps out one glutamate. And that glutamate is used to maintain a level of satisfaction in the brain. What we found by reading the literature was that cocaine blocks that revolving door. 
it downregulates that gene. And so if this building, this cell, let's say had 100 of these revolving doors letting cysteine in, glutamate out, after taking cocaine for a month or two, you might only have 25% of those revolving doors still functioning. Okay, that's a concern. How does that manifest? And before we go there, let me say that the surprising part, nicotine, exactly the same thing. Nicotine affects the number of revolving doors the same way. So it decreases your brain's ability to make glutathione and decreases the brain's ability to secrete this important neurotransmitter. So chronically, either nicotine or cocaine, cocaine, and I'm talking about nicotine because that's what's been published in more detail now, drops the basal level, the baseline level of glutamate. And what that does is it creates a sense of longing. So you see on the left side, normally you have a, a fairly high glutamate level. And on the right side, that's a, a, a situation that's neither longing nor satisfaction. It's just kind of a normal place to be. And if you take hits of nicotine to this region of the brain, and that's shown at, at the bottom, uh, uh, along the bottom of this axis, and you get repeated exposure to nicotine or cocaine, what happens is the glutamate level starts to drop. This is the baseline level. And that creates a sense of longing, a hunger for something. You need something. And here's the diabolical part. That's, let's say, if we look daily or, or weekly after you start, say, smoking cigarettes, this would happen chronically over that week's time period. If you look at what happens uh, in the short term, sorry, here, here, the red line shows you that the same exposure to nicotine or cocaine has a short burst of actually releasing glutamate. Okay, so it's doing two things. Chronically starving those cells for glutamate, creating a longing, and acutely, meaning in the case of nicotine, maybe for only 15 minutes, causing those neurotransmitters to be released at the neuron junctions by a different mechanism than the one I just described. So it's affecting glutamate two different ways. It's blocking it in the basal level and it's stimulating it for a short time. And you can see how diabolical that turns out to be because taking repeated hits of these substances creates a desire and the same substance temporarily relieves that desire. So as you move down this curve week after week, your longing increases and you're dependent upon that spike to bring you back up to a, a level of satisfaction, right? If you were designing a diabolical system, it couldn't get any, any better than that. Okay, what about this turnstile protein? We have, uh, in the past year, looked at the effect of protandum on every gene in the human body, the all 25,000. What I'm showing you here is a section of a spreadsheet that looks at about 25 of those genes. And these are the ones that are most affected by protandum. And so there would be a, a thousand more pages like this, and I have all of those and I've spent hours looking through them. Now, <laughs> as though I didn't have anything better to do with. Um, <laughs> And what you see here is, you know, about 10 lines down is this cysteine glutamate transporter. It's one of the genes most affected by protandum. And here we see that uh, this, I think, is in brain cells. We've done it in vascular cells as well at two different concentrations of protandum each. And that 6.49 is at a high concentration of protandum. And what that means is it increased the number of those turnstile proteins six and a half fold, 649% more in the presence of protandum. And this is it in bar graph form, showing you first what nicotine does. And so we're starting with normal healthy cells, normalizing their level of this turnstile protein that's causing this problem before and after nicotine. And what you can see is the nicotine 
really represses the expression of that protein. So the cells don't have these revolving doors. They can't get cysteine in to make glutathione. They can't get glutamate out to satisfy your brain. What does protandum do to the same protein? It upregulates it. In this case, at a low dose of protandum in, in the thelial cells, vascular cells, 250% in the other direction. All right. So this, again, this is not a, a human clinical trial. This is not even an animal study. These are putting together two dots and drawing a line between them because we think we know how this system works and what will happen. And so the question raised by all of this is, can protandum help break addictive behavior? And elevating GSH has been shown, uh, on the one hand, to be efficacious in humans trying to break addictive behavior by increasing, uh, or by methods that cause increased glutathione uh, in this region of the brain. And they can break behavior to both cocaine and nicotine. We know that protandum elevates GSH levels, and it's in part by increasing that turnstile protein. And what we found is that, or what has been found by others, is that that Turnstile protein is also important in preventing this longing sensation from developing in the brain. So the turnstiles are absolutely essential. And then finally, anecdotal evidence, much of which I gleaned from you at the last Elite Academy, and a lot since then, suggests that indeed protandum might be a useful adjunct and that clinical trials to really prove this are probably an appropriate uh, a question for us to ask. So that's where we are. Again, many of you who have connections to smoking cessation clinics and so forth have contacted me. I think we're well on our way uh, to providing an answer for this. And what an answer that would be. I mean, this is a real need in society at a number of levels. And, and there is no good way. Some of you probably stopped smoking in your lives. And it's, a, it's not an easy thing. It's a tough